The Beat Goes On. Tonight, our regular guests are Tony Amos, Barry Rushton and Shane. And your host on The Beat Goes On, Jared Smith. Once again, a big welcome to The Beat Goes On and a big welcome to our special on Baby Boomer Health. Big thanks to David Holden from Holden Health in presenting some stark facts for us baby boomers to consider. And after considering all the facts, yours truly makes a commitment tonight to lose the kilograms. Helping in the decision, we talk exercise with David Clark from Slimmer's Edge, and we have a delightful visit from Fork. No, that is not a swear word. I am talking about the food and wine classic in Hawke's Bay. It starts on the 6th of November, and we welcome Annie Dundas to tell us all about it. But first up on The Beat Goes On. He's out there in the rain. He's out there in the sunshine. He's out there looking to find the best in movies and music. Our resident guru on all things movies and music, Barry Rushton. It's young Barry Rushton. Oh, very kind of you, Jared. Very kind of you to refer to me in those glowing tones. Young Barry Rushton. And we're missing the young Bob Jones? We're missing Bob tonight. Yes, he was going to fly up, but he can't do it this week. But he tells me, Jared, he said that jet will be out of the air, air, airport very soon and I'll be flying up. So he's he must, got a lovely jet. He must relish the fact that he just drives out to Wellington Airport, yeah. leaps upon and takes off. You know what I mean? It must be just glorious, you know, a thing to have. Yeah, it? well, he's, he's heading overseas anyway. So, um, but anyway, well, Barry, uh, how, how are you? How are you? Oh, very good, Jared, yeah. very good. And there's a new movie starting in about three weeks' time. And it's a movie called 99 Homes. That's what it's called, 99 Homes. Now, I've heard about this. Yeah, I know. And it's a morality movie, basically based, inspired by true events in the economic downturn that happened in the United States of America around about 2008, where decent, you know, American families and stuff... Hard-working. Hard-working families collar. were basically for, tossed out of their houses. Their, their homes were for, foreclosed by the yeah. banks either because A, there was a downturn in the economy and they didn't find work, or B, that they, they didn't see the signs coming, you know, and they borrowed against yeah. it when they shouldn't have, or, or they had all the warnings and put their heads in the sand like emus, or even sometimes, which happened quite often, they got conflicting advice from different divisions within the same bank. Or they might have uh, borrowed on their house so they could buy jet skis and <laughs> SUVs. Well, I'm sure that all of those things were. And so it's around that <laughs> period of time where these people finally have to be evicted from their homes. With their jet skis. <laughs> Maybe so. They're just tossed out. And the, it's the intensity of the opening scenes that really sew the whole movie. You know, and you watch it, and it must be, you know, when you come away from this movie, you really come away feeling blessed for what you have yourself, yeah. you know, no matter where you are in whatever station of life, you know, because something like that to happen is just catastrophic, you know, and, and it's the intensity that happens and it revolves around a guy called, uh, his character name is Dennis Nash and he's played by a guy called Andrew Garfield. Now Andrew Garfield, he plays that part in that series that was out recently called The Amazing uh, Superman, American Superman. Yep. And so you'll recognise him when you see him. He's got a son and he's living in his same family home with his mother, played by Laura Dern. Wonderful. And so he, they, he borrowed against the house, apparently, to get all his tools, you know. And so now when he's out and he worked and he was working in construction, I'm sure it happens all the time when they work and work and work and then suddenly the, the, the company goes bankrupt yeah, yeah. Or, or, or can't pay him. So he's in a hole. And so knock on the door, yeah. you know. And the, the, the realtor, who the hard-nosed realtor with the sheriffs, come and toss him out. And the realtor is a guy called um, Michael Shannon. And he plays a thing called Rick Carver. You know, he's, and and you're, he's great. I like this guy <laughs> so much. So anyway, so they turf him out. And that whole series of images at the beginning of the film set the tone of the movie. You, you watch this. All those in Do better than that. Let's get cooking. What? Sheriffs are here. Why are they here? My name's Rick Carver. I'm a licensed real estate broker. This home has been foreclosed on. No, this I is not happening. I need you, your mom, and your son to step off the property. Just this is not your home. Mr. Carver, please, please don't Sir, you have two minutes. Pack whatever belongings you need. Oh, my God. Does he have to stand there while she packs up? Is that right? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Do you plan on staying for a while? Just a couple of nights. Well, you got to get out of here. I'm going to figure it out. I got no choice. You kicked me out yesterday. I didn't kick you out. The bank did. Did you do construction? 
I'll pay $50 cash. Are you kidding me? $50 shouldn't be a joke to you, son. What are you doing with him? I gotta work, you know? Does he want my home back? Don't get emotional about real estate. No, that's my family home. If you want it. I need to know that I have someone who can handle any situation 24-7. Are you putting notices on my window? When you work for me, you're mine. This is serious money. Do you want to double what he made? Are we stealing? Is this stealing? Feels a bit like trouble. What do you think it was going to mean working for me? The great financial crisis, eh? Wow. The great financial crisis, and Japan, that's what happened. So safe, safe. this guy Nash, is, he's got a mouth to feed his son, you know, and he's determined to try and get the house back again, as you would imagine. And so he ends up actually chasing back to these people who tossed him out because they, he believed they stole some of his gear, and he ends up there taking a job for this realtor guy shoveling out a house which another person had been foreclosed on who had apparently blocked up the sewer system and it was just ghastly. <laughs> and nobody wanted to do it and he says, I'll do it. And it reminded me of my time in America when I lived in America when I owned <laughs> property there. When I first got to America and went to, chiro to the chiropractic college, they had a big lyceum and one of the jobs that they wanted people to do was to clean the trash cans. And of course nobody volunteered and I did. Because I was there, young, who cares, you know. Yeah. I'll do that, I said. And unbeknownst to me, it, it won the heart of a young girl because of the fact that I actually volunteered for something that was ghastly, yeah. you know. Yeah. And you have a funny little turn, twist and turns, you know. Oh, look, Barry, we've got some, uh, we've got some trash cans here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get right to it, Jim. I'll get right to it. But it sends around him. And so he finally takes a job with this realtor guy and starts to delve into the seedy, greedy world of what was going on underneath these things mm -hmm. with regards to the, um, and what, that, what they call rocket dockets. Rocket dockets were where judges had about 60 seconds to make the decision, you're out or your house is gone, you know. Wow. And people would plead, like I've got a family to feed, I've got this, that and the rest mm -hmm. of it. they got 40,000 cases backing up behind them. Within 60 seconds they made the decision, sold, gone, you're out. And so consequently they they were gone. And these people were just chucked out of the road. All their positions just dumped mm. on the front lawn, 24 hours to get rid of them somewhere. And Wow, you know. So the movie centers around the plight of some of those people. What a great movie! Yeah. Oh, it is a great movie. It, it's the intensity of it and the morality of it mm. that shows that, as I said before, when you leave it, you come away thinking, "Man, we are blessed." You know, <laughs> wherever, wherever you are, just count your lucky stars. How wonderful it feels. So you wouldn't go to this movie to be cheered up. Well, <laughs> yes and no. That's a superb acting, and it's superb. The dialogue is wonderful too, and not only that, there's a great little twist at the end that. Not all is bad, you know. That from mm. from bad actions often can come come some great good good intentions, you know. How many other viewers are thinking to themselves, "Why ninety nine homes? Why ninety nine? Why ninety nine? True, it could have been hundred homes, but yeah. apparently this guy, the realtor guy, he was buying up properties as well. So he said, "It's it's it's, it's owning the properties." He says, "Buy them." He says, "You'll have more properties than you know what to do with," you know. And so it's part of the the greed scenario that goes on that fuels these whole humane crises that happen. So it's a fabulous movie. You're going to enjoy it. You know, even again, I'd hate to sort of bring up scores from other people, but Rotten Tomatoes gives it 92%. Now, you know, this is the type of thing that you think, oh, this would be pretty good, yeah. but be ready to be sort of, you know, involved in an intense sort of scenario and follow along a, a morality movie. But it's a great thriller. It's You're going to enjoy it. 99 Homes starts in about three weeks, but you will like it. Thank you, Barry. Good on you. Wonderful. Man. I'll see you next week. Great. Thank you, Barry. Coming up next on The Beat Goes On, we say a big hello to Annie Dundas from Fork. Now that has got your attention, but it stands for Food and Wine Classic. It's all happening in November in Hawke's Bay. Annie is here to tell us all about it. Annie Dundas, welcome to The Beat Goes On. You must have the most wonderful job in the whole wide world. I would love your job, touring New Zealand, telling everybody about the Food and Wine Festival in Hawke's Bay. Yeah, it's not bad. Ah. Oh. How did you manage to score that great job? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it comes with the territory. Hawke's mm. Bay is a, a bounty, a very bountiful region of food and wine, and we thought, well, we need an event to celebrate that. So it was born that way. And you've come up with a great title for the festival. Can I show our viewers? Yes. Fork. <laughs> now, of course, it represents fork, but it's the Food and Wine Classic. Oh, that was a clever idea. And I, I know that you were one of the people that came up with Fork. Yes, that is true. Yeah, I so can't take all the credit, but yes. <laughs> I think we should tell our viewers also that it's coming up very quickly. In fact, it's the 6th to the 15th of November. So it's not far away, Not is far it? away at all, no. Yeah. 
And how long have you been planning this? Uh, we kick in summer fork planning in about May, yeah. and, uh, and and it works on the basis there's 65 events across 10 days. Uh -huh. So uh, the wineries, the cafes, the restaurants, they all put mm. their submissions in and submit events, and we approve and build programs, and yeah. uh, we launch ticket sales late August, so that's how long we've been selling tickets. Now, who all got together to make this happen? Of course, you've got the council, which you work for as part of uh, Hawke's Bay Tourism. Yes. You've got the wine industry itself. Yeah, we have. We've got a great connection collection mm. of tourism operators yep. and uh, many of those are made up of wineries and restaurants and cafes etc mm. and so I think we'd been looking for an event Hawke's Bay had had a food and wine a one day food and wine festival which many other regions now have and we thought well actually we've got a little more to tell people about yeah yeah well it's huge isn't it yeah and very much about our locations as well so we mm. wanted to have food and wine in, in location mm. so that's why the wineries etc loved it because they get to show off their own yeah. patch and it kind of built from there. Yeah. And of course, you couldn't have a better thing than uh, than having a region that is famous for its wine. Wow! I mean, there's some fantastic vineyards over there. Give us five that spring to mind immediately. Oh, five that spring to mind <laughs> without being favourite. You know, goodness <laughs> you me. Um, well, Tamata Estate is one of the most yeah. well-known um, wineries in New Zealand, and obviously mm. their flagship wine, Colerain, has had a stellar year, and they've launched their 2013, um, which is to die for. Um, Craigie Range would be another one which visitors must go and see. Yeah, well um, known. Elephant Hill, um, Trinity Hill, oh. um, Tewonga Estate, Clearview, I probably done over five, yeah, um, Ashridge, yeah. um, there's many, many, many. So yeah. we're pretty lucky and pretty blessed with some fantastic wineries. Are you a wine drinker yourself? I am, I have had a few, <laughs> um, yes. Um, I mean, the, the distinguishing piece for Hawke's Bay from a wine point of view mm. is that we're a hotter, drier climate. So mm. we tend to uh, make those big bold reds and uh, so not so much a little bit of Pinot Noir but we're probably more well known mm, for our for bigger reds. bolder reds the Merlots the Cabernet Sauvignons mm. and the Syrah and then the other is the Chardonnay so Hawke's Bay and pretty much Gisborne share that title of probably growing some of the best um, the best grapes for Chardonnay in New Zealand so we're pretty lucky. Now the food side what is it about the food side that Hawke's Bay can offer? Well, Hawke's Bay, traditionally, it's a very much a growing region. Mm. So Hastings District in itself is pretty much the powerhouse it's, of probably yeah, most of New Zealand. The breadbasket of New Zealand yeah. in a lot of ways. Isn't um, it? And so what it does, obviously, there's some big growers, mm. but it also has spawned a lot of smaller, um, smaller operators that are doing fantastic things mm. in organics, etc. So um, Bostock, which are one of our biggest apple producers, are mm. also now um, doing the best free-range chicken I think I've ever had in my life. Yes. Um, we've got uh, tomato mushrooms, which are doing some amazing things. You can now go and visit the mushroom <laughs> yeah. factory. Um, Dams and Jam, which is a you know. A lovely little unique product but fantastic tomato figs mm. there's all sorts of fantastic products which all come together at the farmers market obviously every Saturday and Sunday 10 days but 60 uh, 65 different events I'm going to be mean to you again and say if you could only go to two, what would, would they be? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, probably opening night, which is yeah. a showcase of about 15 wineries and, mm. and great Hawke's Bay food, some of those producers I mentioned. And that's at Black Barn in their, in their market space. Mm. So that's kind of a first course of fork. So you get a little taster. Um, so that's just a two-hour event. So I'd probably do that. And then, oh, the burger bar with Martin Bosley is always good fun on Saturday <laughs> night from four. Yeah. So that's uh, a bit of a gourmet burger yeah. at Vintage Wine. So that's a bit of fun. Yeah. So that's two. And all ages. I mean, I can see this being a great baby boomer thing. This is a baby boomer chat show, so uh, I can see them uh, getting in their cars or their camper vans and motorhomes and heading over there and having a wonderful time. But what about all ages? It's, uh, uh, there's something for everyone? Well, there's even something for dogs. So we've got a, um, <laughs> if you're a dog lover and you Bring like to dog. drink wine, we've got an event on Tuesday the yeah. 10th called Yappy Hour. So that's all about the dog, and so you can bring your dog and try some beautiful wine at Trinity Hill. And it also introduces the winery dogs, because there's many yeah. wineries with dogs, so it's a bit of fun for the pooch and, friendly. And uh, is it a good idea to give your dogs wine? <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't be giving any alcohol to the pooches, but uh, their owners may be imbibing. Of course, everybody's conscious about cost. Um, some good bargains to be had. I mean, you can go to the top tier events, yes. but you can also... 
get over there on a budget? There's a really nice uh, mixture and what people mm. tend to do is they'll come for a weekend and they'll pick a, a selection yeah. of events. So for example our opening first course is $45 mm. and that's a two to three hour event. The following day we've got $10 masterclasses so that's, it's, and that features people like Ray mm. McVinney and Nikki Wicks and Brett McGregor so you can spend $10, there's some walk up events which might end up costing you about yeah. 20 bucks or you could then pay a little bit more and go to some of the pricier events. So mm. our, we have Al Brown coming down to do an event, a mystery, a secret location lunch, and his ticket price is around the two hundred dollar mark. So there's a range, yeah, there's and a range, range of for things. everyone. And accommodation, of course, um, everything booked out, or there's plenty of room left. Oh no, we've got room. Yeah. It's the, the beauty of Hawkes Bay. We've yeah. got lots of there accommodation. There are lots of good motels yep. and hotels. Yeah, lots of motels and hotels. Wow. Hey, I'm tempted myself. I think um, you should come. Yeah. How can I get off the uh, Big Goes On and get over there for 10 days? Wouldn't it be wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> you might need to go on a diet at the end. <laughs> Before you go, uh, fascinating. Last week, the people of Hawke's Bay all stood up and said no to amalgamation. They um, did. And you weren't, uh, you were a fan of amalgamation? Or? Well, we work, uh, Hawke's Bay Tourism works across the region already. So we yeah. operate in a kind of, I guess, an amalgamated sense. And it works pretty well for us. Yeah. Um, when we talk about visitors, we want them to come to Hawke's Bay and spread themselves around. So yeah. that model works quite well for us. But, you know, the people have spoken and that's and that's what they've yeah. chosen to, the path they've chosen to follow. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out. Now, Bob Harvey, who was a mayor of Waitakere, and he was a so opposed to the amalgamation of Auckland, but he was on the show about three weeks ago and he said it was the best idea ever was to amalgamate in Auckland. Has Hawke's Bay missed out on an, on an opportunity? And, but they couldn't see it. Um, who, time will tell, yeah, time I will guess. Tell. I mean, we are a population of 150,000 mm. people and um, we need to have our voice heard. So yeah. I know that there's great willing on behalf of councils mm. to work together to ensure we're being more efficient and sharing services and we've got to make sure that happens. Um, it'll work if we do that. Now tell me about this great job before you go. Um, you're here in Auckland tonight, of course, but uh, you're touring constantly talking about the great uh, festival. Uh, Always. What a good job. I bet you love it. I bet you when you get up in the morning you think, this is terrific. Well, it's a pretty nice destination yeah. to talk about. So yes, it is, uh, <laughs> you could be uh, marketing some other places. but you no. be selling insurance, you know. <laughs> this is true. So, you know, Hawke's Bay is pretty special. Annie, thank you for coming and telling us. We're going to see you next year because I'm sh there's sure to be another festival next year and for the rest of our Absolutely. natural lives, isn't it? Yeah, it's never going to stop now. Never, ever. New Zealand has changed. We've gone from the dairy with a tip-top ice cream to uh, diversity. <laughs> thanks. Pleasure. Once again, a big thanks to Annie for joining us on The Beat Goes On. And before we talk to our special guest, we have some winners to announce from last week's show. One lucky viewer won a copy of Ken Ring's 2016 Weather Almanac. From the draw, the winner was Kelly Sheffield from Pararua. And by the way, a big happy 50th birthday to Pararua. Another lucky winner won a magnum of wine from Maison Vuron in Newmarket. From the draw, the winner was Shona McLeod from Takadini. Congratulations to our two winners and stand by your letterboxes. And before we continue, we ask of our viewers a special favour. Like us on Facebook. Stay in touch with the longest running chat show in New Zealand. And a reminder for all businesses catering for the baby boomer, if you would like to advertise on The Beat Goes On and promote your product, give me a call. That's Jared Smith on 09 525 1512, 09 525 1512. Once again, a big welcome to The Beat Goes On and a big welcome to our special on Baby Boomer Health. Big thanks to David Holden from Holden Health in presenting some stark facts for us baby boomers to consider. And after considering all the facts, yours truly makes a commitment tonight to lose the kilograms. David Holden, welcome to The Beat Goes On. Thank you, Gerard. Hello, David. Great How to be you? here. Thanks for coming in today because uh, today we're going to have a session on uh, baby boomer health. Precisely. The health of the baby boomer. Now, I'm one of the oldest baby boomers. I think Shane's one year older than me. I think, born in 1946. I'm right. 47. And as time goes by, David, um, what happens is we're pretty content with life. Absolutely. And we put on a few pounds. We're still pretty content with life. And then we put on a few more pounds. And then somebody might say, oh, you're putting on weight, aren't you? Mm -hmm. now, once upon a time when you were younger, you would have said, oh, I better get rid of that. But now that you're older and you're a little bit more content, what does it matter? What does it matter to, 
just put on the weight and, uh, and just be happy. You've got other ideas, David. You just don't think this contentment is real contentment? No. Well, <laughs> the, this, this is the thing, Gerard. As a scientist, the, the scientific literature shows that people who are overweight or even obese have a heightened risk of what's called the big four mm. with, by the World Health Organization. That's all types of cancer, the three types of diabetes, all 11 types of arthritis, and all types of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So definitely you want to try and get your weight within 10% of your, your normal healthy mm. BMI. Now, I'd say to that, well, look, if I, um, I'm 68 today, and if I get another six or seven years, that'll be great, you know. So how do you combat that in people's minds that, no, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be like that. You could have a fantastic life because it's, it really is the weight that's holding you back, isn't it? Well, look at it this way, Jared. I've had a lot of very wealthy people come and see me yeah. who've got all the money you want in the bank, but they've got cancer. Yeah. Or they've got serious heart disease, they've got heart failure. Life's a misery for those people. Yeah. And they all tell me, not one hasn't said they would trade all the money for health. Wow. And the key is you want to do something on your health now. Don't mm. procrastinate because once yeah. you get older, it takes longer to bring your body back into balance. So yeah. the key is to work on it sooner than later. That's the message. Now that's a great argument. So you've got wealthy, wealthy patients with cancer, got all the money in the bank, everything to live for. Exactly. And they want to yeah. live longer, and enjoy then. that money, see their grandchildren go up, get married, do trips, etc. All the, the, the major hallmarks of life that you want to live for, and they're being cut short. And you really believe that if they'd maintained their body better, maybe the cancer wouldn't have come on? There's no doubt of that. The evidence is really, really clear. If you keep that weight to within a reasonable range of the BMI, as I said, 10% either way, you're going to live longer, you're going to have more vitality, more energy, who doesn't want that? Yeah. More get up and go, and you're going to live longer. You have right. a much lower chance of those diseases. And we can measure these parameters scientifically, like I did with you when you came and visited the clinic. Yeah, we'll get on to that in just a moment. But uh, first of all, we're going to thank Mary Garner. She uh, was talking to me, and uh, I was having a little chat to her about uh, the weight, uh, putting on weight. And she said, I, just, I know just the man. That's why you're sitting in the seat today, right, David. Now... What's your qualifications to be talking on this? You're a naturopath? I'm a naturopath and a biochemist. Yeah, and a so bio I've had a science training. I've got a master's yeah. degree in science. And so I've coupled the best of evidence-based scientific natural medicine um, with my practice. And so Mary's one of the team that yeah. comes and works with us. She's a nutritional consultant and a hypnotherapist, a very good one. Um, we've got a whole range of practitioners, five of them. You can see them on my website, holdenhealthcare.com. Um, and we do quite a range of testing. That's the difference between yeah. how I practice and how many other naturopaths practice. I don't guess I do scientific testing to set benchmarks. And you can see DVD clips of all yeah. those tests on davidholden.co.nz. Now, I'll tell our viewers that I've been through the tests. Mm -hmm. Very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Nothing unpleasant about it. No, it was, not uh, invasive. Now, the first thing we did was we weighed, you put me on the scales. Yep. Let's start there. And it turns out I'm 118K. Right. Way overweight. Now, what should I be? I'm, a, I'm about 5'11". I, I did see on there that I should be 81K. Yeah, according, to, according to the VLA test we did on yeah. you, a good weight fuse around 82 to 85, depending on your muscle mass. So that's 37... I'm 37 kilo. And that's a significant amount. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now, how be, will that affect my life? In that, in well, quite significantly. Yeah. It'll reduce your energy levels. It can give you problems with insomnia. Um, it can affect um, your your vitality for sure. And as I said before, it gives you a much higher propensity to those big four diseases we spoke about. And mm. that's the concern because once you get on track <laughs> with those, yeah. that they, to a degree, some of them can be irreversible. And it, it, it shortens your life and it reduces the vitality you have in life. Yeah. So your fun factor, the enjoyment factor. Now you're not just talking to me, you're talking to all those baby boomers out there because they're right. all putting on a few pounds here and there, mm -hmm. they're content with life, mm -hmm. you know, the mating is over, mm -hmm. I've got, you know, I'm not going out there looking for a new girlfriend, no. so I'm just pretty happy, sure. but in fact, it's silently working against you, that's what you're well, saying. Well, it, it is, and that's the yeah. thing, it's working away in the background, I mean, all these diseases take 10, 20, 30 years to develop, yeah. and the longer you maintain that extra weight, the more at risk you're putting yourself at, and that's what the science shows very, very clearly, and that's what I've, I've attempted to yeah. instill into you is to look at that more seriously. Make it more of a priority. 
Now, you talked about using science. So it's not just weighing yourself. We saw that. But then you've got other instruments now. So let's. what was the next thing we, we went through? OK, so as I said before, you can see DVD clips of all of these on my website, mm. davidholden.co.nz. The two tests we did with you was the VLA test, which stands for Vitality, Longevity and Anti-Aging. Yeah. That was developed by Harvard University for NASA for the space program in the 80s. Yeah. Wow. And you're of the age, you remember when we, you know, 20 years ago and we saw the six o'clock news and these um, aging astronauts were floating in space for the space shuttle missions in their 50s or mm. 60s, but they were trim, they were buff, they were strong. And it was the VLA technology that helped them get there. So this test tells me um, your biological age as opposed to your physical age. Ooh. It shows me your hydration levels, your toxicity levels, which can accumulate in the body over mm. years depending yeah. on your diet and your lifestyle, your fat mass and your muscle mass, and it gives us the optimal ranges to aim for. Mm. So we've got goals we can set goalposts for. Yeah. And that'll help with whatever weight loss program you choose to do. I can then monitor you and tell you scientifically, yes, you're right on track, or no, you're not. You need to be tweaking a few areas here to get the right result for you. So what was that first one? There's your biological age and your... Biological age, age your mm -hmm. hydration levels, and your toxicity levels, which what's is a my, key what's marker. What's my biological age then? Um, take a breath. <laughs> take a breath. Your bio um, age was 89. Yeah. So that's because of the extra mass you have, Yeah, the old uh, middle age spread. So I'm 68 and yet my bio, the bio age is 80, 89. 89. So what that means is your cellular metabolism is working at that level. Wow. So there will be other uh, health issues that will be associated with that that we mm. discussed privately in consult. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things we can do to improve those. Yeah with simple dietary changes. Look at that. <laughs> Get rid of this paper somehow. <laughs> well, it, just gives you, it gives you a wake-up call when you need it. That's the thing. Uh, now, what about toxi tox toxicity? Well, yeah. your toxicity levels yeah. on the graph here were definitely quite elevated. Yeah. And so we discussed about your diet and you're not yeah. drinking a lot of water mm -hmm. and how we can get you on to, to more um, fruits and vegetables, particularly to flush yeah. those toxins out. There are specifics we didn't talk about because you were pushed for time. Yeah. Um, there are the detox protocols I can give you which will flush these out, which yeah. will reduce your chance of cancer occurrence yeah. and heart disease and diabetes quite significantly. So what are the toxins that are gathering in the body? Well, we get them from our environment, from everything we, we eat, drink and breathe. Mm. If you live in the metropolitan area, you're getting a whole yeah. lot of air pollution, water pollution, um, sprays, chemicals on foods, mm. additives, um, sugars accumulate in the body and they damage our, in, our filter organs, the kidneys, the liver, the spleen. Mm. So we can't keep the blood as clean as the body would like to maintain optimal health. And where does it store the toxins? In fatty tissue. In fatty tissue. In fatty tissue. So if so, your toxic load is high, yeah. you've got a propensity to put on more fat to, to uh, isolate those toxins and get them out of reach from the body so it can't be damaged by them. So the body very cleverly says, look, we don't want these toxins, so we'll put we'll it in... Wrap them in fat and, and isolate them. And put it around the stomach. Mm, for the men and the well, thighs that's of the smart ladies. thinking body, isn't it? It is. <laughs> It is indeed. Wow. So this is a key factor. And giving people an awareness of what's going yeah. on is what it's about. Because then you've got the power to change. Yeah. You've got choices. And you're informed with this information, which is what it's all about. Information is power. Now, I, I also was very dehydrated, which I knew were. I'm not thirsty, and yet you say no. my body's not working. Yeah, your, your, your hydration levels were quite low in the red zone, yeah. which is not great. Mm. So again, that reduces electrical conductivity in the body, which can, uh, can cause all sorts of issues with um, brain function, memory, sleep, concentration. A whole range of factors are affected by hydration. And if you don't have enough water, your body can't flush those toxins out that you come into contact every day. Mm. So hydration is actually a crucial part of losing weight. In fact, scientific research has shown if you were to drink three litres of water a day between meals, six that's, glasses, a, yeah. no, that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot of glass. Well, yeah. If your average glass is 250 mils, that's oh. 12 glasses. 12 glasses a day. If you yeah. were to drink, that's a lot of water to drink. But if yeah. you were to do that, you can lose easily a kilo a week. 
of fat because it flushes those toxins out. Now the last test we did, that was interesting, wasn't it about the, uh, the antioxidants? That's a very cool machine. That's called a biophotonic antioxidant scanner. And it's a high-tech scanner developed by Stanford University in the States about 15 years ago. It fires a laser beam at your palm. It didn't hurt, did it? Oh. It doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. And it gives us your um, range of antioxidants from zero to 60,000 scale. The higher your level of circulating antioxidants in the body, which is from your diet, yeah. the lower your risk of cancer and degenerative diseases. And that's been well proven in the literature. And it's very easy to get your antioxidant score up. Um, not taking lots of armfuls of pills of antioxidants, that can help, mm. but it's the diet. Yeah. It's the, the rich, brightly coloured vegetables that make all the difference. And you know, you've got a fairly high meat diet, um, so you want to balance that with more vegetables to give you more fibre. You want carrots, tomatoes, spinach, kale. Um, carrots, you can blend them into a mm. drink. You can actually make them taste delicious. Yeah. You can put some avocado, some protein powders in there, make it taste really nice as a meal substitute and that will push up your antioxidant score very quickly. So what's wrong with my McDonald's Big Mac? To me it tastes beautiful. Right. And you know where the taste comes from? The fat, the salt and the sugar. And <laughs> this information is now widely out there yeah. and baby boomers have grown up with this. They've watched these, the golden arches flourish all over the country yeah. and the KFCs and the burger fuel and all the rest of them. And this is why our obesity rates are rising, because people are being dictated to by their taste buds. Fat, salt, salt and, sugar. and sugar. And sugar's the worst of the lot of them by mm. far. The saturated fat we're now realizing isn't as bad as we thought. But when you eat lots of sugar, it stimulates the liver to seroconvert that sugar into storing more fat in mm. the body. And that increases atherosclerosis, which is cardiovascular disease, and also feeds cancer cells. Yeah. Sugar is direct fuel for cancer. Yeah. Um, I better do something. So we started yeah. off at 118. Would you like to come back now and again on the program to, to, um, to have a look at my progress and for to sure. guide me through this? I've got to lose weight. Yeah, well, I'm concerned yeah. about your health, and that's yeah. what I do. And yeah. I help hold people's hand and show them how they can do that best. Yeah. And we've got a whole team that does that at Holden Healthcare. And so that's our approach, is to give you the information, show you what you can do. Mary takes people into their kitchen, shows them what foods they can prepare, makes them taste delicious. <laughs> the key is there's got to be two things with a good, healthy diet. It's got to taste good, like your, you know, mm. your Big Macs, yeah. um, and it's got to be nutritious for you as well. So we keep the saturated fat down, the salt down, the sugar down, the nutrient density up, so your antioxidants go right up, and people notice very quickly, Gerard, their energy goes up. They feel better. They sleep better. They have more get up and go. When the grandkids come over, they've got the energy to chase them around mm. and get out and do things rather than just sitting in a slump at night and wanting to doze off in front of the TV. Yeah. So it gives you the motivation and the fuel to get the result. When did you last have a Big Mac, uh, David? I haven't had, I, I don't actually don't eat hamburgers anymore <laughs> because I, I'm fed, I'm gluten intolerant, so I prefer not to eat them. Homemade ones, different story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your life is blighted without a McDonald's hot <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look, David, this has been great. I really appreciate it. And um, you're going to make sure that I stay on the straight and narrow. That's the plan. And uh, I'm determined. Can people give you a call and uh, go through the same process? I've they can through? indeed. Yeah. Just contact us at davidholden.co.nz or call our clinic at Auckland yeah. 09 282 288 And ask for David Holden. David, just leave a message. Yeah. My receptionist will clear it and um, we can book you in, do a range of testing. Depends what the person mm. wants. Yeah. I do see a lot of people with, with chronic illness, cancer and heart mm. disease particularly, and we use the same technology to help prevent and reverse mm. those conditions over time, yeah. given the particular case concerned. What's an ideal weight for me to get down to? I'm at 118. Let's yeah, I mean, if we get you down to 90, that would yeah. be a, a major... 90. That would be a major. 90 kilos, yeah. get you under that 100, that magic yeah. 100. Yeah. That'll make a big, big difference. I'll be a new man, you reckon? Exactly. All right. As long as you're prepared to, to change your diet, 
yeah. and start to make some lifestyle shifts, you'll get the results. And of course, exercise. Absolutely, that's a key part of it. There's, yeah. only, there's no secret to weight loss. There's only two ways to lose weight. I'm going to make a meme over to myself. Jared, eat, do eat some less exercise. calories, do some exercise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> David, good on you, Jared. Good to see you. We're going to see you back For next sure. time. Okay. If we see a significant difference, you're coming into, uh, we're going to there you do go. a little dance. We'll do the test again. And <laughs> I'll be dancing with you. Okay, thanks, David. You're welcome. Bye bye. Thank you, David. Coming up next on The Beat Goes On, we welcome another David, David Clark from Slimmer's Edge. David is here as part of our special edition on Baby Boomer Health. Check it out at www.slimmersedge.co.nz. It's a big welcome to David Clark from the Dave Clark Five. Oh, sorry, wrong guest. <laughs> Dave, you're not a member of the Dave Clark Five. You, in fact, nope. have got a great little uh, slimming venue in Anzac Road in Auckland. I've been there many a times. Very good. And we've got you back on the program, David, because I may be doing something quite foolish. I've committed myself on national television oh, <laughs> to lose weight. All in the quest of baby boomer health. Baby boomer health. We've had a wonderful guest just before you, David, I'm, I, you know him too, um, David Holden, who said that um, being overweight, uh, and I am, can cause trouble later in life with the big four, heart attacks, strokes, uh, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Are these your thoughts as well, David, or 100%. what's your thoughts? You don't see many obese 80-year-olds. No. <laughs> and so, unless you do the work now, I, I've... I've had many people teach me over the years healthy foods and various things. And one thing I noticed as, as we start reaching over 50 to 60 is those teachers that aren't exercising aren't looking that good, mm. even though they're eating really well. So food is very important, but to make the muscles work, be toned, just gives you another little credit. Is diet enough? Should we do exercise on top of that? I know everybody knows that exercise is good for you, but uh, should I embark on this quest with just dieting? Well, it depends if you want to have fun in life. <laughs> do I want to have fun? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like skiing, kayaking and, and tramping and doing things like that. And really, some of my buddies are 80 year old and still paddling rivers and food, it gives you good blood. It gives, gives you a lot of cleanliness in, in your organs and things like that. Mm. But exercise gives you mobility. Yeah. And I think mobility gives you passion. It gives, gives you that little bit of extra goal to make those little bit of turn up, turn up decisions four times a week to, to exercise. Now, a lot of us baby boomers, I touched on it with David, and uh, I'll get your thoughts on it. We get content. You know, you get to 68, you get to 72, and you say, <laughs> hey, I'm old now. Uh, I'm not out there courting. Um, I've got a bit of weight on. I'm generally pretty happy now. I've got through life. I've got lovely kids. And uh, so I think I'll just relax and enjoy it, even though I'm carrying mm. far too much weight. What's your, what's your message to those people? Because I, I have been one of those. Well... You don't get old because you stop playing. You stop playing and you get old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, keep playing. We're not that old. The 60 now, we might be thinking it's old, but it's not. Mm. It's, it's really not. We're not the same as the, the previous generations to us, where they had certain conforming things. To do. We, we're still able to really jump around and have a good time. Let's look back, back a bit. I'm not sure about your mum and dad, but um, they did seem to feel that when they got to 65 or 70, they were old. Well, my yeah. grandfather was retired at 50. Yeah. Hard Cooper, you know, working with the fire. He had, you know, emphysema and they were old. Yeah. And, and our, 50, our, our yeah. baby boomer generation, we have a different attitude. We really yeah. are a fortunate generation. We have great music and, and all that. But I, but I do think unless you use it, I'm starting to see it now with some of my friends, they can only do a few hours skiing and they're getting sore body functions and their, their stomach's starting to come out. When the body is, the, the stomach is coming out, the organs are swelling, they're overloaded. And I think David will have made, made this clear about the foods yeah. that overload these organs. If you have a, if you have a grab, there's yep. often... I've got one of those. Yeah, you've got one yeah. of those. But there's not as much as what this is. Yeah. And so you've got to think what's under there well, yeah. is your liver, your spleen, your pancreas, your stomach, your intestines. And if they're working too hard because of volume control, yeah. if you're eating too much, if you're eating just out of habit, you know, they're just going to start needing to do much more than they can do. And, and do they enlarge? Do they? they enlarge. If you're at a big factory and all of a sudden you treble the workload, yeah. the factory's got to get bigger. Yeah. to do that. And that's what we're doing with our body. And, and as you get older, eat less. You don't need as much. 
Mm. You know, and, and I think plug in four times a week of exercise. Yeah, no. Get the machine. The muscles are your machine to burn the food. Yeah. And if you work in those, then you, you've, you've really got less to be put into fat and to swell the organs. And you're gonna, you, you eat less when you're exercising. And so we're getting back to that main point, uh, David. Would dieting be enough or convince me that I should <laughs> exercise as well? I mean, you've got a lovely gym. Yeah. Tell me why uh, I should be down there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm determined. Well, just tell everyone else you're going to do it. You, you really, you really, <laughs> well, you really you made on TV a commitment, <laughs> yeah. so you've got to do it. And I think that's the big thing. Once you've made that commitment, you've mm. told people around you, your friends, your family, that you're going to do it, you have to do it. Otherwise, you make a fool of yourself. Yeah. And for you, you might not enjoy it. Just go, think, turn up. Yeah. Turn up and do it. Just put it in your diary just as important as any other yeah. diary meeting and just go. You might not feel like it. Don't make excuses. Just go. So, you know, what's, do I really want to exercise? Yes. No. No. Turn up. <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's no out. You've got three months to really get yourself in shape. Yeah. And you're, in, you know, you're inspiring your, your mm. grandkids and your children and the people watching TV. And, and you're going to make a huge yeah. difference and you'll feel fantastic. What would you have me do first? Turn up. Turn up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I promise to turn up. What's next? <laughs> oh, look, the first thing is I'll, I'd measure you up, get your body fat, get, yeah. get all the... Um the, the the weight you're around mm. about 119 at the moment. Yeah, no, 118. 118. Well, so don't you want do that to, come, to me, David. You want it to come down to what 95? Yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, that's that's very doable in the next three months. Yeah. Um, sometimes that you've got good muscle mass, mm. so that helps lose weight. So once we get that first consultation and understand what your goals are and where you're going to be turning up to, the first time or well, the first week is easy. Ten mm. minutes, fifteen minutes on the cardio. Then with the vibration machines, we just start to mobilise your body, yeah. um, get you stretching, get you feeling like you're more nimble, uh, and, and just make the first week enjoyable and break the pattern of you not wanting to go. Right. Now, David, if anybody wants to go on a quest like I'm going, a Don Quixote quest, um, to, uh, <laughs> uh, and they want to talk to people like yourself, Slimmer's Edge, wonderful gym, Anzac Avenue, easy to find, isn't it? And why is it every and time? Google it. Google every it. time I come on the show, you, you, you somehow make me think, hmm, how can I entice people? So how about for a 28 day challenge, $49. Wow, that's good, isn't so it? So I'll look after you for, for one month, yeah. give it a kick, give it a start, and um, for $49, we'll do every day if you want, or four times a week for four yeah. weeks. Good value. Yeah. Good value. And, you know, normally it's about $25 a yeah. week. But You're a rugby man to the core, aren't you? You love so your rugby. I love my rugby. So you weren't that, uh, we, before we came on, you weren't that happy with the, the game last week, last Saturday. Uh, oh, it was two days away, wasn't it, with Georgia? No, I was happy with the game we played against Georgia. I think every team has got a real sharp card that they play out over their ability. Yeah. And when they play in the All Blacks, they throw they, they bring it out, the don't they? they bring everything out yeah. give it us. And we want to make sure we're not injured, we want to play a good game, we want to, you know, we're professionals, mm. we want to give the audience a really good yeah. good run through but we don't want to be going through to the quarterfinals injured. Yeah. No, I'm excited. David, I'll be down to the gym Good. and we'll be having a wonderful time. Even though I'll be gritting my teeth all the oh. way, we'll be having a fun time. No, and I'll be there every time. <laughs> Thanks, David. He's a singer and he's a man that can shake, rattle and roll. And he takes us down memory lane week after week with Where Are They Now and the Song of the Week. To finish the show, it's our pop encyclopedia, Shane. It's the one and only <laughs> wonderful Shane Hales. Oh, well, that's watch. a lovely watch, yeah, Shane. It is, yeah. yeah. It's, it takes a lot of weightlifting to lift that watch. Now, um, <laughs> it's the lead in it. <laughs> that's, that's your bling, is it? It's bling. It's definitely bling. There's nothing else. Hold it up. I can, uh, the, it's hold lovely. It. T take it off, Shane, and hold it up for the camera. I mean, the, oh, you're talking about the watch? Yeah, okay. It's a very nice watch. <laughs> <laughs> How's that one? Is yeah. that the right one? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. The thing is, it's a lovely blingy watch, and I love it. And it's not a cheapo, but the thing is, um, I can't read it because <laughs> I need my glasses on to read the time. Because <laughs> it's still one like the old-fashioned one. It's not digital. It's uh, it's got hands. So there you go. 
Oh, what have you done? Yours, it, um, that is a very nice watch. It's a beautiful but watch. But it did make a noise when we shook hands, didn't it? It did, uh, yeah. yeah. It rattled. But Shane, what I do want to talk about, what a great afternoon at the uh, the Big Goes On Dance Club. Wasn't that great? It was fantastic. And yeah. thanks for coming along, everybody. We had a couple of birthdays there. Mm. Everyone was celebrating, had a good time, getting down a boogie. Yeah, this, we had the girls yeah. from Waiheke Island that came over. Oh, it was fantastic, yeah. Nothing to do with the music. It's that wonderful charm and personality. It must be. <laughs> They're after my watch. <laughs> <laughs> They're after your watch. Now, Shane, uh, that all, of course, um, it pales, doesn't it? It, it does. This goes a funny sort of a pale colour into insignificance when compared to... Song, Song of, of the Week. week. It is a beauty. Oh, it really is. Now, look, he talked a bit gravelly and he... Well, he didn't speak gravelly, but he, he had so a singing he's got voice. voice at the moment, yeah. Hello, Dolly. Yeah. Well, hello, Dolly. Oh, yes, yeah, Satchmo. And uh, Satchmo, yeah, of course, uh, Louis Armstrong. Yes. Um, otherwise known as Pops as well. That was one of his nicknames, Pops and um, Satchmo. He was born in 1901 on August the 4th. Now, that was disputed for year after year after year, even after his death, right up to the mid-1980s, when a researcher went to the little church in New Orleans where he was baptised and looked through the baptismal records and found that he was actually, he wasn't born on the 4th of July, uh, which he claimed all his life. He claimed he was born on the 4th of July, 1900. But he was actually born on August the 4th, 1901. Wow. And they didn't find that out till mid-1980s, the truth came out. He thought that being born on July the 4th was very American, and he wanted to be famous, and he, you know, it all tied in with his whole image thing, you know. Well, he nearly had the great, uh, the July the 4th was nearly the best day in the whole world, because guess what, Shane, my birthday's on the 3rd of July. 3rd of July. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he was one day off the you best day, day he could have chosen. Yeah. You rushed a bit, eh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, there he is, Satchmo, and he's born in New Orleans, and a little place, and uh, he lived, he, he grew up, I should say, or dragged up, in a place called Storyville which is a suburb outside of New Orleans. And in, in those early days, in the early 1900s, it was a sort of um, a licensed red light district. <laughs> it was tough. And what they did, the idea behind it was, license this area, Storyville, we'll have all the brothels there and all the red light places we'll, and all the druggies. Keep them over there. All in one yeah. big bunch. Yeah. They'll all be happy fornicating in one corner. <laughs> and the rest of New Orleans can get on leaving a decent you know, standard of living. And uh, that was the idea behind the whole place. And of course it was a tough place. And they did congregate there, all the prostitutes and everything else. And that's where they went. That was the red light district of New Orleans. So it was no accident when his uh, father ran off. Poor mum, she had no way of making any money. She had to turn to prostitution. So she went out on the, on the game. And uh, so Satchmo, our baby Louie, he was hanging around the brothels and he would sit in there. And in those days, they had bands in the brothel. They did, didn't they? I was just going to catch you out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I read about it. I read, oh, about you read, it. Uh, yeah, I read that. Yeah, I read that, yeah. yeah. I was just going to try that off. <laughs> you got me. But, uh, yeah, they had bands sitting in the corner, a little jazz band, you know, uh, brushes on the drums and uh, piano and honky a little tonk. bass. Yeah, honky-tonk type thing. Dixie Lamb music. New Orleans. And uh, so he, that's when he became interested in music. While he was sitting waiting for mum to do her tricks and things, he used to sit and watch the band and, oh, you know, and he became very interested in music, intrigued by it all. And uh, getting into trouble in the streets at the same time, he was taken away to this place. It was called the New Orleans Home for Coloured Waifs. Now, I mean, <laughs> is that a shocking description uh, of a building? You know? yeah. so the New Orleans Home for Coloured Waifs not white waves or coloured waves mm -hmm. and so he got taken there and of course his education and everything it helped and they saw the power of music as part of the healing process for these waifs uh, who were out on the street and doing their thing and getting into crime and so he was uh, started to learn about music and of course he'd taken a great interest in music sitting in the brothels waiting for mum <laughs> uh, so he took to it and he started playing cornet that was his choice of uh, instrument and he started playing around uh, various charitable uh, venues and things and making money for charities. And he became quite a great, you know, quite a good player. By the time he was 11, he actually, he was, he dropped out of school. He dropped out of school at age 11. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that was young. He gets a job, his first professional gig. 
he starts playing in a, uh, a, a dance band, you know, in New Orleans, in a little club. But then they move on to the riverboat and he starts, he gets his great job and he becomes under this influence of this band leader who ran the steamboat orchestra, basically. That'd be a great job well, and on he a steamboat, yeah. Yeah, well, he went up and down the Mississippi River all day, you know, mm -hmm. playing in the band. And he honed his craft and suddenly he was in big demand. Mm -hmm. He's starting to give, uh, you know, extended solos, tr playing trumpet then. And he, he learned how to uh, read and write music. So he became quite proficient. By the age of 20, he was like, wow, he yeah. was a great musician. But anyway, he started to get uh, later on in his career, as he started to move up with the, you know, the echelons, up the, the, the fancy guys, the Bing Crosby's he's playing in movies now, mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra, all these guys he's working with, Count Basie. He gets up with all these guys and he's, he's a class act now. And he's well known through the 30s and 40s. So um, they start to call him a bit of an Uncle Tom. Uh, and this is the American Africans. Yeah. They're calling him Uncle Tom because yeah. he's rubbing shoulders with the white boys. And he had quite a lot of privileges. He was actually allowed to stay. He didn't have any hassles. Stay in the uh, whites only hotels. He ate in the whites only restaurants with his partners and his buddies, Bing and Frank and yeah. so on. Yeah. And so, you know, you can see the American Africans getting very upset about his uh, privilege. Oh, privilege, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's a bit of an Uncle Tom, you know. Yes, you man, know, cowtowing with all the whiteies. Mm. Um, it's quite a racist thing going on, so. It is a strange thing, instead of being supportive of him. Yeah, he they, was breaking down ground. He is breaking the ground, so I mean, getting in there, I mean, yeah, it, it always, uh, they always it, take the negative, don't they? Yeah, the negative side. So yeah. he was getting a lot of negativity. And uh, in the 50s, he held his own. He came out, of course, when Eisenhower, they had that big uh, drama at Little Rock when they, uh, the desegregation of the uh, schools in America started. And Little Rock was one of the first. And they had that huge uh, yeah. thing in the 1957, 56. 56 it, uh, and it was all going on and uh, you couldn't, uh, the whites were saying, no way, we're not, you know, you're not coming into our school, mm. you go away and all that sort of stuff. What was her name? Rosa Parks. Yeah, it? yeah, Rosa Parks. Um, and um, so it was a big drama going, but he turned around and said to Eisenhower, um, he was actually going to Russia uh, to do a tour for the American government. And he turned around and said, cancel it. I'm not going. The way you're treating my people down in Little Rock you can shove it, you know, yeah. basically. And he said, I'm not going. And he dropped it. And he, and he criticised Eisenhower, the president at the time, and he said that you are gutless and uh, your inac inaction uh, was just terrible. And um, he condemned him for it publicly. Mm. And, uh, you know, so um, he stood up and, of course, he got a big pat on the back from um, the black, uh, black community of uh, America at that time. They all saw him as a different man. He wasn't Uncle Tom after all. He was Uncle Arthur. He was Uncle, <laughs> Uncle Louis. <laughs> hey, Louis sent me. <laughs> but what I've always been interested in is that great nickname, wasn't it? Satchmo. Satchmo is amazing. Yeah. How did he get that? I mean, there's no one else called Satchmo. Yeah. And it, it's a funny story because Satchmo. in the yeah. 20s, he went out busking at, at the beginning and in a little dance troupe, they used to do little dance steps in the street and sing in a vocal group, you know. And uh, when you're out there doing that busking in those days, you used to uh, get the pennies thrown to you and you'd have to pick those pennies up while you're still dancing around and singing. <laughs> and what they used to do, the ones that weren't singing, they'd grab hold of the pennies while, while they're dancing mm. and whack it in their mouth. And they were used to be called satchel mouths. And that's what they were called. The people that busked for pennies were called satchel mouths because it was a, like a satchel. They threw the pennies in their mouth and kept dancing. And they'd have this mouth full of pennies until they finished the song. And that was how it got shortened because he was known as satchel mouth. Don't we have life? And satchmo. Easy. Yeah, yeah satchmo was how it ended yeah. up. Imagine all those copper pennies in your mouth. Yeah. Oh, that'd be terrible. Yeah. But uh, yeah, satchmo, a, a great artist, of course, and it, it all came to fruition for him and he became one of the best trumpet players, mm. band leaders, you know, with the hanky and all that, the trademark yeah. stuff. And uh, with that voice, no one had a voice like that. He probably still had a couple of pennies stuck yeah. in his throat. <laughs> I think he started off with a voice like mine today, so um, yeah, yeah. Gets better. you could do a good impression of Satchmo yeah. today. I see. Hello. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, hello, Dolly. What a great, what a great song. Who yeah. wrote it? Where did it come from? Why did it happen? Well, I'll tell you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Shane.
well, it was the Broadway hit, Hello, Dolly. And, of course, then they made the movie. And um, Hello, Dolly was the name of the show, and Hello, Dolly was the One song. One of the big songs. It was the big song. Of course, he covered it, and uh, it, believe it or not, he knocked the Beatles off the chart at the time. It was their third consecutive number one, 1964. Yeah. Beatlemania just arrived in America. He was the first guy to knock the Beatles off the number one spot wow. with Hello, Dolly. I bet he got some pennies for that show. I bet he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet his mouth was full. I bet he couldn't swallow all the penny <laughs> Hello, pennies for that Dolly. One. Really, if someone came in and auditioned with a voice like that, you go, sorry, next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but he just has something special yeah. with that face, yeah. that flamboyant, you know, the smile. Oh, yeah. It's just the magic. The whole persona is just magic. So I can surmise, Shane, after that wonderful tale, <laughs> the song of the week this week has got to be... It's got to be the big show song, Hello, Dolly, number one for Saturday. Hello, Dolly. This is Louis Dolly. Why did that give you back where you been now? You look it swell, Dolly. I get in, Dolly. You keep going, still going, you stay going strong. Yeah, bro. Yeah, just watching him blow that drum. <laughs> Good old Satchmo. Good one. Beautiful, yeah. Hello, Dolly. And everyone knows it. It's just a classic. And um, did you know? Look, no. I did know, but I wasn't <laughs> going to tell you that I knew. Now, did you know his other nickname I mentioned right at the beginning of the piece? It was called Pops, as in P-O-P-S. Mm -hmm. And why did he get it? Well, he had a problem with everyone's name. He could never remember a name. You know, he's introduced to someone, and he'd go, pleased to meet you, and he'd forget the name later, yeah. instantly, you know, and he could never remember names. So he'd go, Pops. OK, Pops. <laughs> and he called everyone Pops. Women, you know, men, women alike, they were Pops. And so it rebounded on him in the end because everyone said, oh, old Pops. Um, and he became, his nickname was, ended up Pops. All his friends called him Pops. So he wasn't just Satchmo, he was called Pops as well. And um, I thought you'd like to know that. Yeah. John. <laughs> <laughs> Pop something. That's all right, Robert. It's <laughs> setting in. Well, I can only look forward to saying it um, with great relish this week. With relish. Relish. Hello, sausage. Well, I do like a relish. <laughs> I do like a sausage with a bit of relish. <laughs> Sterling job, old sausage. Sterling job. And Shane, I can just say once again, Shane, you've yeah, done, done it again. again. I'm in the room swaying. Don't be 